Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this privilege of coming before you to read, to study, to meditate, and to apply your word to our spiritual, family, normal lives. And Father, we pray that today you'll open our eyes of understanding that we may see what you have reserved for us in your word in Jesus' name. We know that there's always a word for the hour, every hour of our lives. And we pray, Lord, that the appropriate word for this moment and this hour, you will give to every one of us in Jesus' name. May we not miss what your spirit is saying to every heart, to everyone, this moment of time. And as we understand and meditate and apply your word to our lives, we pray that every one of us will benefit thereby in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. We have been studying the book of the Psalms for some time now. Today we are studying Psalm 20. You will notice that we are making a selection of the Psalms we are studying. The reason I think should be obvious to you that if we were to go through one by one a psalm a week it will take us about three years before we'll be able to finish and we don't want to spend so long time on just one book because the bible study is devoted to studying the whole bible so then you'll need to do something that you will see some of the ones who have missed out because we cannot possibly cover everything and you will read and study and meditate and apply what you read to yourself already we have made some selections and in these ones that we have studied you have seen how we go from verse to verse and we virtually exploit or explore every part of every sentence so that we can get the best from every verse of whichever psalm we are studying. So I plead with you that you'll do yourself a world of good by taking all the others that we have not selected and you will study them, read them, compare them with other parts of the scripture on your own. And as you do that, I pray that the spirit that inspired the word originally will enlighten and illuminate you so that you'll be able to get the best out of your own private personal studies in Jesus' name. Now today, we're looking at this psalm, Psalm 20, very short but very full. Let's look at it. I'll read to you to start with from the beginning to the end and then we'll try and see what the Spirit is saying to every one of us today. Psalm 20 from verse 1. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifice. Selah. Grant thee according to thine own heart and fulfill all thy counsel. We will rejoice in thy salvation and in the name of our God we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Now know I that the Lord saveth is anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand some trust in chariots and some in horses but we will remember the name of the lord our god they are brought down and falling but we are risen and stand upright save lord let the king hear us when we call as we read this psalm, 
already you can tell it's a psalm of prayer. Now you can tell by the language that is used almost in every verse. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. You know that's prayer. The Lord, the name of the God of Jacob, defend thee. It's a prayer. The Lord send thee help from the sanctuary. That's prayer. The Lord strengthen thee out of Zion. And then it says, the Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Now, there's prayer here. When we talk about prayer, there are different kinds of prayer. We have the prayer of petition. Personal petition. That is you asking the Lord something for yourself. And we know a lot about that kind of prayer. Many times, we're always making petition. Making requests. Asking the Lord what we want him to do for us personally. Or as family. Or as a church. Or as a nation. But then there's another kind of prayer in the Bible. And it is the prayer of praise. When you come before the Lord. And all you are doing is that you are offering praise unto the Lord. Many people do not know much about this kind of prayer. That is the prayer of praise. But as you read in the Psalms, you will discover that a lot of the Psalms are devoted to the praises of the Lord. Just to come and adore him. That's why we, always, we also call it a prayer of adoration. Just to come and render thanks because of what he has done. That's why we also call it a prayer of thanksgiving. Just to come and show your gratitude unto the Lord. We call it a prayer of gratitude. Praises, adoration, thanksgiving, gratitude. Many people do not know a lot about that kind of praying. But the Bible has a lot to say about it. There's another kind of praying. And that is the prayer of intercession. And there have been great people in Bible times and Bible days that came before the Lord and at that particular moment, they never asked anything concerning themselves. It wasn't for personal petition. And at such a time, they were not even thanking the Lord for anything. It wasn't a prayer of praise, but they were asking for other people. Abraham comes to mind at this point. When he heard about the coming urgent destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He came before the Lord. You know the type of prayer he offered? A prayer of intercession. Another time we read about Moses. He was coming from the mountain top. And then as he came from the mountain top, he saw that the children of Israel had become naked in their idol worship. They had got away from the Lord and the Lord too had disinherited them. And then he began to make supplication. You know the kind of prayer he prayed? The prayer of intercession. We read about a man like Joshua. A man like Samuel. And a man like David. A man like Daniel. You see Daniel began to inspect and to check up. In the writings of Jeremiah. And he knew that 70 years were appointed for the people. And he knew that. The children of Israel will not long remain in captivity. He began to pray. The kind of prayer that we are talking about. Prayer of intercession. But the greatest example that comes to mind is the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only kind of prayer he prayed for himself is that the Father will strengthen him to drink our bitter cup. The only kind of prayer he prayed for himself is that the Lord will help him that he will endure the shame and the cross and the suffering and the agony for you and for me the rest of the time. All the prayers he prayed, he prayed the prayer of intercession. You remember Paul the Apostle. In all his epistles, always praying. He remembered the faith of the Romans. He remembered the faith and the testimony of the Colossians. He remembered the stand and the faith and the belief of the Ephesians and he prayed for them. Almost in every letter, in every epistle that he wrote, as he said, I remember you. I remember your work of love, your labor of love. 
I will remember your faith that is spread abroad all the earth. Then he will say, I am praying for you. And so, we know that this kind of prayer is very, very important. That we ought to engage in fervent, faithful, sincere, persistent, persevering prayer of intercession. It is that kind of prayer that we're reading about in this psalm today. And I've titled this, The Privilege of Intercession. How do we know this? How do we know that? This is a prayer of intercession. Look at it. From verse 1. The Lord hear thee. You see, they were not praying for I, me, mine. They were praying for somebody else. The Lord hear thee. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary. Strengthen thee out of Zion. Remember all your offerings and accept all your bond sacrifice. Grant you according to your own heart's desire. Fulfill all your counsel. And then they said, we will rejoice. Which means, it's not only one person praying the prayer of intercession here. It's a group of people. Who are these people? And for whom were they praying? They were praying for their king. They were praying for the anointed. They were praying for David. Look at verse 6. Now know I that the Lord saveth is anointed. You see, as David saw the volume of prayer going up on his behalf, and he saw, as he saw, the whole nation on their knees for the king, as he heard all the tribes of Israel raising up a voice of prayer, making requests for the king, he said, Now I know that the Lord saveth is anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with his saving strength of his right hand. And so, you know, the whole nation was making intercession for their king. Let me talk about that for a moment. It is very important that we realize that we pray for leaders, we pray for kings, we pray for princes. And it doesn't mean that these people we are praying for, that they are not praying. If you know anything about David at all, of all the kings of Israel, I think we can say without any contradiction, without any fear of being wrong, that David was, the, was one of the most prayerful kings in Israel. Well, compare David with Saul. The first king, you know, he prayed much more than Saul. Compare David with Solomon, his own son. Of course, he prayed much, much more than Solomon. Compare David with Rehoboam, with Jeroboam, with Ahab, with Ezekiah, with Jehoshaphat, with even Josiah, with any of the kings of Israel. He was probably the most prayerful king Israel ever knew. And yet, they knew. Even though this man lived by praying, even though his life was preserved by praying, even though he was a great man of prayer himself, the whole nation still found time. To pray for their king. Are we surprised? No, not at all. Jesus Christ, the perfect example in praying. Jesus Christ, the one that prayed early in the day. And he prayed during the day. And the whole night, he will go to a solitary place and he prayed. Do you know, at the time of his agony and affliction. At the time of his distress and problem. At a time when he was to be betrayed and crucified, when he felt a need to pray, he called some of his disciples, he said, watch with me, pray with me. And if you have noticed that Peter, a great apostle in the early church, we're told that Peter was one of those apostles that said, we will give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the world. And yet when he was imprisoned, you know what the church did? They prayed for that prayerful apostle they prayed for him in acts of the apostles chapter 12 verse 5 then peter therefore was kept in prison 
but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. We make great mistakes. When we think a pastor can pray for himself, our leaders in the church can pray for themselves, and the people we know to be serving the Lord and to be prayerful people themselves, they can pray for themselves, and therefore we do not need to pray for them. We need to. David, very prayerful, the nation prayed for him. Jesus Christ that prayed and lived on prayer and said that I know that my heavenly father is always with me and is always hearing me. Yet, he required others to watch and pray with him. And Peter, one of those apostles that addicted themselves to the ministry of praying, the church prayed for him. You know Paul the apostle? From the time he was converted and he appeared in Damascus, there is one thing that he singled out of his response to the Lord when he met the Lord. The Lord told Ananias and said, Behold, he prayed. You see, the first three days that Paul the apostle got converted, all he could do was just be on his knees and be praying unto God. And you know, if you have read the Acts of the Apostles, he prayed every time. And if you have read in all the epistles, he prayed every time. And yet, even though he was an apostle that had seen mighty signs and wonders, he had seen the signs of an apostle done everywhere he went by prayer. And yet, he requested that the people will pray for him. In Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 30. Now, I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, that he strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you, be refreshed. Was that the only time he asked people to pray for him and pray with him? Was he so weak at that time that he was asking they would pray for him? No, not at all. He requested for the prayer of the saints of God, of the children of God every time. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 and verse 19. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me. That utterance may be given unto me. That I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. You can see again there that he asked the people that they will pray for him. Colossians chapter 4. Verses 2 and 3. Continue in prayer. And watch in the same with thanksgiving without praying also for us. Praying also for us. That God will open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. And you see Paul the Apostle, even though himself he was a man of prayer from the time he was born again. And all through his ministry as an apostle. Yet he said that they should pray for him, Philemon. Verse 22. But without prepare me also a lodging. For I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. The point I'm making is this. That the ministry of intercession. The privilege of intercession. The responsibility of praying prayers of intercession is all in the Bible, in the Word of God. And this Psalm 20 that we're reading today is a prayer of intercession. The nation, the people of God, God's faithful, believing people praying for their prince, praying for their king, praying for their leader, and of course, as well as you'll see in the study, praying for themselves as well. We'll see three points in this psalm. Point one, requests for the prince. 
Point two, rejoicing of the people. And point three, reasons for praise. Point one, request for the prince. Psalm 20 from verse 1. What requests were they making for their king, for their prince, for the anointed one? You see, these people were unselfish in their praying. The request they made in their intercession was deep, was rich, very extensive. May I say, it covered everything that their king, their prince could ever desire. Look at it. From verse 1. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. They prayed for their king and they said, The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. Then they prayed another request now. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. In their request they said, The Lord send thee help from the sanctuary. In the continuation of the prayer, they said, The Lord strengthen you. They knew that times of weakness, times of human frailty, times of shaking knees and trembling waist, times when his body or his leg will not be able to take the load or the weight of trouble upon him. And they said, The Lord strengthen you out of Zion. Then they said, The Lord remember all thy offerings. They said, the Lord remember all your consecration, all your commitment, all your devotion, all your offerings and accept your bond sacrifice. They said, the Lord grant thee according to thine own heart and fulfill all thy counsel. At the latter part of verse 5, the Lord fulfill all thy petition. What could David have wanted? That these people did not pray for. They prayed for everything. Now let's look at it one by one. And this will help you to know. When you are praying for other people. How to pray. Uh, you know some people they say. They don't know how to pray. That whenever they open their mouths. And they want to talk to the Lord in prayer. The words that come out. They say. They are so weightless. Valueless. And they feel that they don't know how to pray. Well, the book of the Psalms will teach us how to pray. How to pray for ourselves. How to pray for our families. How to pray for other people. How to pray for people in need. Let's look at this prayer and let's see how rich, how deep, how high, how extensive in scope. The prayer they prayed for the prince. The request they made. Look at verse 1. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. I think they studied the life of David and they saw that the life of David was full of trouble. There was a thorn at every crossroad. There was trouble at every turn of his life. You know what? Even when David was a teenager, you think of the trouble of a teenager alone in the field, alone in the wilderness with sheep, helpless, defenseless animals. And a lion appeared. That's trouble. But the Lord heard him. And helped him. And strengthened him. You know the prayer they were praying. They said king. The Lord has always helped you. The Lord has always heard you. The Lord has always strengthened you. And we pray for you. That if any trouble still comes. The Lord hear thee. In the day of your trouble. You know another time. A bear came. What greater trouble could come to a teenager than a bear coming to that teenager alone all by himself? It wasn't too much later that Goliath confronted David. And David encountered Goliath. And he cursed that young man with his idols, with the idols of the Philistines. And he came against David with the spear and the sword. That's trouble. And it wasn't long after that, that even Saul, the first king of Israel, with all his strength, devoted all his time, and he left the throne, and he was chasing David about as a full-time ministry. Can you think about it? That Saul left every other thing, 
let every other every other employment every other consideration and the only thing that he thought about the only strategy he made the only plan he had was to catch david and kill him and destroy him and he sent everybody in the nation that he could control that they should seek and search for david and he said anybody that will hide david will be his enemy what trouble can be greater than that when the king of a whole nation makes it his full time job to plan and make strategy and destroy david that was trouble and you know even after saul had died absalom rose up in his own family and he was chasing his father wanting to kill his father and ahithophel the greatest of all his counselors joined with absalom that's trouble you remember shimei how shimei also how he was uh, you know abusing david i'm telling you that david had a lot of trouble you see if you are going to pray for people look at their lives look at their needs they looked at the life of david they knew it was a life of trouble and they said the lord hear thee in the day of trouble what a great prayer then they said the name of the god of jacob defend thee you know why they prayed that prayer when david came before goliath he said you come to me with the sword and the spear but i come to you in the name of the god of israel whom you have defied and you know when they were praying for him they said david we know your defense we know that since you are young since the time of goliath the name of the god of israel had been defending you all we are praying for you is that name that name the name of the god of jacob defend you that's my prayer for you that in your trouble in all the things that you may go through I know the devil doesn't like that you are a Christian, but never mind. God has built you upon an unshakable rock. And he says, upon this rock, I build my church. Thank God you are part of that church. If you are born again, if you are a child of God, if you are a saint of the Most High God, you are part of that church. You are built upon the rock, eternal rock, the ageless rock, the rock of ages, and you will never be shaken. The name of the God of Israel will defend you, will protect you. Look at Proverbs chapter 18. And in verse 10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is saved. That name will still work for you. You know, before Jesus led, he gave every one of us the use of his name. And he said, whatsoever you will ask in my name. He said, the Father will give it to you. When demons attack you, these I shall follow them in my name. You will cast out devils. When sickness comes and it knocks at your doorstep, in my name, you will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. When people try to poison you and they try to get you out of the land of the living, in my name if you drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt you when serpents and scorpions of the powers of darkness when they wage war against your life with oppression and depression and possession whatever attack and whatever affliction in my name you will take up serpents behold i give unto you power over all the power of the enemy you will tread on serpents and scorpions and nothing shall by any means hurt you Whatever your need may be, he says, whatever you ask in my name, in my name, he will give it to you. Never forget that name. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. In Psalm 20 verse 2, they said, the Lord send thee help from the sanctuary. Send thee help from the sanctuary. What a great prayer to pray for a king. You know, many people will think that the king will never need any help. They will be coming to the king to give them help, to support them, to judge them, to give them justice, and to deliver them from their enemies and the people that are after them. But the people will never think that the king himself needs help. So they said, as you a king, try to help 
your subjects. So then, you are a subject of the King of Kings, that King of Heaven, send you help from his own sanctuary. You see, there are times we need great, great help. Fathers in the family, mothers in the family, manager in a place of work, director in a place of work, a leader in a, in a corporation, or a manager in a corporation. Whatever it is that you have, that you are. And people don't think that you ever need any help when you need help. And people don't know the Lord send you help from his sanctuary. And you know this is a wonderful thought and a wonderful prayer. Because you know, the sanctuary of God in heaven will never go bankrupt. There may be famine in the land. There is no famine in heaven. There may be scarcity and need on earth. There is no scarcity and need in heaven. It may appear to be. You know some people, they say somebody is as poor as a church rat. That means, well, the reason they say that is because you don't keep a yam and tomato and pepper and, you know, foodstuffs. You keep them in the kitchen in your house. You don't keep them in the church. So, the rats have nothing to eat in the church. That's why they say somebody is as poor as a church rat. That means then, the sanctuary on earth may not have any help to give unto you. But thank God for the sanctuary in heaven. Because in the sanctuary of heaven, you know what the Bible says? It says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. All you need can come from above. That's why he says, I will lift up my head, my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. I believe at your time of need, your help will come from above. In their prayer they said, the Lord strengthen thee out of Zion. You see, David came to some times in his life when he had no strength. In fact, a time came that the enemies came and they looted the place where he had his property. When he discovered it, David cried. David wept. And all the men that followed after him, they wept until there was nobody to comfort them. And we are told that David wept more than they all. Can you imagine a time in the life of a man who had killed a lion? Can you imagine a time in the life of a man who had killed a bear? Can you imagine a time in the life of a man who slew Goliath? Can you imagine a time in the life of a man that was a great warrior when he cried and there was nobody to comfort him? These people knew that sometimes the private life of a king, of a prince, of a leader may be so sorrowful and agonizing that nobody may be able to see his tears and he may be so weak that he doesn't think he can take another step. And he said, David, king, anointed of the Lord, our prayer for you is... The Lord strengthen you out of Zion. That's my prayer for you too. You see, there are times that people may not know what you are going through. People may not know your tears. People may not know the load and the weight upon your life. People may not know why your steps are slow. People may not know why sometimes there's no smile. People may not know why the tears are running down. People may not know why you are so weak and tired and you are wondering, can I take another step in my Christian work? Brother, sister, people may not know, but God knows. People may not be able to encourage and strengthen you, but God will. The Lord strengthen you out of Zion. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ, it came to a time in his own life, the bitter cup that he was to drink. And he went to get Simony. And he fell down on his knees. And he began to pray. It was a time of agony. A time of affliction. A time of weakness. A time that he needed help. And he was sweating like great drops of blood. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know. That sometimes it happens to us like that. If it happens to our Lord and Savior. You may not know. You see people that, you know, they smile at the storm. You see them in their Christian life. You see that coordinator, that zonal leader, that area leader, that woman representative, that Christian worker, that brother, that sister in our zone. You know, it's always happy. 
never a problem. That member of the prayer warrior is always effective. Well, we praise the Lord. Because God makes them to ride on their storm. But you know, sometimes privately, some of those people you are talking about, some of those people you are looking at and you say, you know, is a member of the prayer warriors. It's always boisterous and happy and victorious. Thank God that's the way they are. But you know, once in a while, it happened to Jesus, our Lord. It happened to Jesus, our Master. You know, sometimes some of these bold people that you see, fruitful people that you see, a time comes in their lives that they may sweat. A time comes in their life they may be weak. A time comes in their lives it appears the load of responsibility or the load of the problems of the world is weighing them down. At such a time, we are praying for them. That the Lord will strengthen them out of Zion. You see, in the time of the weakness and the time of the pain and the agony of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord God in heaven sent an angel. And the angel strengthened him out of Zion. Out of a sanctuary. And you know, many times in the life of David, he passed through that valley. The valley of tears. The valley of pain. The valley of problem. The valley of loneliness. The valley of wondering, why am I here? Why am I a king? What am I doing? Why are all these things against my life? Who am I? What is my strength? Is my strength the strength of stone that all this shall come upon me? But the Lord strengthened him. The Lord answered this prayer they prayed for him. The Lord strengthened him. Look at verse 3. Remember all thy offerings. They prayed. They said, David, the Lord remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifice. If you know anything about David, he was a man of offerings. Every time he came before the Lord, he came to give an offering to the Lord. You remember? At a time that he was even a teenager, very, very young, Saul was having an evil spirit attack upon him. And he came, he offered his musical talent. You know, at another time, when the people of Israel, when they faced Goliath, he offered a sling and stone. And his confidence in God, he said, I will fight against him. You know, many times when the battle raged against the children of Israel, he offered himself. He offered his services as the angel of destruction came over Israel. And he, and he destroyed many, many people in Israel. And eventually when he saw that angel draw the sword, nobody could appro approach that angel of death and angel of destruction. He went and he fell before the Lord and said, Lord, what have these sheep done? If you want to do anything, any havoc and any evil, any destruction, lay hand on me and destroy me. But leave these sheep alone. And God told him, he said, make a sacrifice. And he went to a parcel of land and Aaron said, my lord the king. Anything you want of the land, anything you want of the oxen, anything you want of the wood. Take everything I give you free of charge. Oh, David said, I'm sorry. I'm a man of offering." I will not give anything to my Lord that costs me nothing. I will pay the full price. You see, these children of Israel, they knew that David was a man that offered everything that he had. And he said, the Lord God in heaven, remember all thy offerings. And I think if you are a Christian, you are the same. I'm sure you have offered, of course, you've offered your heart to the Lord. You've offered your time to the Lord. You have offered your talent to the Lord. You have offered your treasures to the Lord. My prayer for you is, the Lord remember all thy offerings. He will not forget. He knows. He knows. All that we give for the glory of his name. All that we give for the upliftment of his name. For the extension, expansion of his kingdom. He knows the Lord remember all your offerings. Look at Hebrews chapter 6. And verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. He will never forget. 
Any little thing you do, any great thing you do, he knows all the time you give. And you see in our church here, we give a lot of time for the service of the Lord. Apart from the fact that we come here on Sunday, we come here on Monday, we come here on Thursday. Now if you realize, there's something special about the believers in this church. You see that um, in other churches, and we don't say this to put them down, we are just rejoicing because of what the Lord is doing for us. We don't say this to say that they are bad and we are good. We just say this to say that the people of God here, they offer a lot. You see, in other places, it is difficult to get them to Bible study during the week. If they can give just the time to the Lord Sunday morning service, they will not even think of going to evening service. Not to talk of going for Bible study during the week. Not to talk of a revival hour during the week. But you know in our church here, look around. This is our second session. That shows we are opening our time to the Lord. And when you come on Thursday, look around. We have a lot of spillover. Outside people are so many. We offer our time to the Lord. The Lord will never forget. All the time you offer to the Lord. And you know we don't stop there. We offer our time in evangelism. We offer our time in visitation and follow up. We offer our time in following up the newcomers. The people that come to our church for the first time. You know sometimes when you think about our workers in this church. They are doing a lot, lot more than some of the full time preachers in other places are doing. Oh, why I am saying that is this. That the Lord says in, verse, in this verse 10. For God is not unrighteous. To forget your work and your labor of love. Which ye have showed toward his name. In that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence. To the full assurance of hope unto the end. That ye be not slothful but followers of them. Who through faith and patience inherit the promises. By the grace of God, we will inherit the promises. Because we give our time. We give our talent. We have a lot of people that have different, different talents. And everything is used in our church here. People say, well, I can do this. Does the church have any use of this, my talent? Other people come and they say, well, this is my talent. This is my ability. This is my gift. And I am at the disposal of the church. I am available. Whatever the church can make use of in my talent. Here am I. Here is my talent. Not only our time and talent. Our treasure. Oh, we give. We give tithes. We give offering. We give gifts. We give a lot of things. We give to the church. We give in the zone. We give for transportation. We give everything, every time, to all people that are in need. The Lord, remember thy offerings. And accept thy bond sacrifice. In Psalm 20 verse 4. And grant thee according to thine own desire. And fulfill all thy counsel. See how they prayed for the prince. See how they prayed for the king. And he said, we have given details of the request. But now, whatever remains, which we have forgotten, they said, the Lord grant you thine heart's desire. Just like Jesus said, Mark chapter 11, and in verse 24, Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. So then we know that this is appropriate prayer that the Lord will fulfill all thy petition all thy petition you know some theologians you know what they say they say God doesn't answer every prayer then they say another time God answers prayer but he answers in different ways he answers by saying no or they say he answers by saying wait and then they say, one case out of a hundred, he answers by saying yes. So then, the way those theologians are teaching, it appears that 
most of their prayers are not answered. Only 1% or less is answered. But look at verse 5 of Psalm 20. We will rejoice in thy salvation. And in the name of our God will we set up our banners. The Lord will fill all thy petitions. How many of your petitions? Everything. The Lord will fill all thy petitions. I pray God will answer your prayers. Now we go to the second point, rejoicing of the people. You see, there comes a time in the life of a child of God that he moves from request to rejoicing. He moves from petition to the praises of God. He moves away from asking to adoration. And he says, I've asked enough. I have prayed enough. I have petitioned enough. I have made enough requests. It is time to rejoice in faith. And so, this is what we find them doing. They moved away from request to rejoicing. From asking to adoration. And he gave thanks unto the Lord. Look at verses 5 and 6. We will rejoice in thy salvation. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petition. Now know I that the Lord saveth is anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving of the strength of his right hand. Brothers and sisters, we need to know that after we have prayed, we should believe God and then begin to rejoice. In Psalm 21, verse 1. The king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation. How greatly shall he rejoice. There is a time of making requests. There is a time of rejoicing. In Second Chronicles, chapter 6, verses 41 and 42. Now therefore arise, O Lord God, into thy resting place, thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation, and let thy saints rejoice in goodness. Let thy saints rejoice in goodness. If you have been praying and making requests, I believe the time has come for you. You will rejoice in the goodness of the Lord. He will answer. He will never fail. He will put laughter in your mouth. In Psalm 35. Psalm 35. Verses 9 and 10. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee? Which delivereth the poor from him that is too strong for him? Yea, the poor and the needy from him that spoileth him. That's the kind of God we're serving. He delivers the poor people from the hands of those who are stronger than they are. And if you have any, op any opposer, any persecutor, if you have anyone stronger than you can deal with, and is trying to op oppress your life, the Lord will deliver you. In Psalm 85, from verse 6, Will thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? When revival comes, the people of God rejoice. That's what the Lord has been doing for us in our church here. He has been bringing revival, restoration, renewal unto our hearts and lives and families. That's why we are full of joy in Psalm 5, verses 11 and 12. Psalm 5, verses 11 and 12. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. If you are putting your trust in the Lord, the time of joy will definitely come. You see, you will not allow that thing to so drag you down that you will not know joy and happiness in your life. It's not only sorrow. It's not only sadness. If you have undergone the time of sorrow and sadness, 
the time of joy and rejoicing will definitely come. Let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy, because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee, for thou, Lord, will bless the righteous, and will with favor will thou compass him as with a shield. That's the reason the people of God rejoice. God's salvation causes joy for his people. When God brings victory, deliverance, protection, then in answer to all our prayers, it brings joy to praying, believing people. The confidence that these people had of an answer of peace to their petition for themselves and for their good king made them to say, we will rejoice in thy salvation. And that means to you that we, ourselves, as we pray, as we believe, as we have confidence in our God, we too can say with these children of Israel, we will rejoice. Will you rejoice? We will rejoice in the salvation, the deliverance, the victory of our God. And because of that, we will set up our banners for jubilation and celebration. Let's look at the last point. Reasons for praise. Psalm 20, verses 7 to 9. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They are brought down and falling. But we are risen and stand upright. Save Lord. Let the king hear us when we call. Here the people rounded up their prayers. And they said their neighbors trust in chariots and horses. The other nations, pagan nations, heathen nations. They trust in chariots and horses. The canal. The unbelieving, the people that are faithless, they walk by sight. They walk in unbelief. They trust in the arm of the flesh. They trust in chariots and horses. But watch it. All these people that trust in chariots and horses, they are brought down and they are falling. But these people, they rejoice and they praise the Lord. They said, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. We who remember the name of the Lord our God, in verse 8, we are risen and we stand upright. Let us understand that God is greater than man. The king of kings is greater than any prince on earth. If you don't have any human helper, but you have the God of heaven as your helper, he will help you. He will support you. And you will have more than the people that are trusting in chariots and in horses. Look at Psalm 33. From verse 16. There is no king saved by the multitude of an host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. And horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him. Do you fear the Lord? Then the eyes of the Lord are upon you. The goodness of the Lord is upon you. The eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him. Upon them that reverence him. Upon them that honor and worship him. Upon them that hope in his mercy. Verse 19. To deliver their soul from death. And to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waited for the Lord. He is our help. He is our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him. Because we have trusted in his holy name. And so we can praise the name of the Lord. Because we depend upon him. In 2 Chronicles chapter 32. 2 Chronicles chapter 32. Verses 7 and 8. Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that, that is with him. For there be more with us than with him. Brothers and sisters, let's trust in the Lord. Whatever you see of the enemy, whatever you see of the persecution, whatever you see of the opposition, 
whatever you see of the difficulties and troubles and trials in the world, they have been more with us than they that be with the enemies. Because if the Lord will open your eyes, you will see the chariots of heaven. The angels from heaven, they are all around you. It says in verse 8, with him is an arm of flesh. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. The Lord is on our side to help us and to fight our battles. Now as the children of Israel rounded up this prayer for their king in Psalm 20, verse 9, they said, Save Lord. Let the king hear us when we call. And you see, these people have been praying for the king. They said, O oh Lord, hear the king. Let your name defend our king. Send him help from your sanctuary. Strengthen him out of Zion. Remember all his offerings. Grant him according to his heart. Fulfill all his petition. Now, they ended up the prayer by saying, Lord, help the king so he can help us. Strengthen him so he can encourage us. Provide for him so he can meet our need. And when we call upon him, let the king hear us when we call. Isn't that a prayer for a person that is going for interview? It says, Lord, let those managers hear me when I call. A student that is going for an examination, it says, let these examiners hear me and do well to me when I call. Isn't that what we want when we write an application for promotion? Let the promotion panel hear me when I call. Isn't that what you are looking for if you have a case in court? Let the magistrate hear me when I call. You see, they prayed for the king and they prayed for themselves as well. They said, Lord, we look up to you. That will bless the king, help the king, strengthen the king, lift up the king. But then, when it comes to his turn, that you want to help us through him, open up his heart, make him generous, and let him hear us when we call. I pray this same prayer for you. That when you call, whoever God is going to use, a manager, a director, a king, an examiner, a helper, a supporter, a benefactor, may they hear you when you call. Let's rise up and pray. Let's bring all these prayer points before the Lord and thank Him for what He's teaching us. He's teaching us how to pray. He's teaching us how to make a request. He's teaching us how to call upon Him. He's teaching us how to make intercession, praying for other people. Let's come to the Lord with prayer request. Bring that intercession before the Lord. Bring that petition before the Lord. Bring those requests before the Lord. He will hear you when you call. Prayer is your greatest weapon. Use it. Prayer is your greatest defense. Use it. Prayer is your backbone. Rest on it. Prayer is the greatest support under you. Lean on it. Pray. And he will answer. And he will answer. When you call, there is no need in your life that prayer cannot solve. Pray. And pray for other people. Pray for other people. For the pastor, for the leaders in the church, for workers and members in the church, everyone you know. And pray fervently, seriously, persistently, perseveringly for others in need. And you know the Lord loves you. Whatever troubles you are going through, it will soon be over. Just pray. The Lord hear you when you call. And the King.